Um, Amity, I want to transition over to you. Share with us a little bit of, of what your story is with your son, Kobe. First of all, tell us about your baby boy. Oh, he was my most favorite human being in the world. He was my first child, and uh, that makes him the first love of my life mm -hmm. because I don't think a person understands true love until you have a baby. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they're just everything to you. Um, both of my children are. But he was my first baby. And um, as you see in that picture, he was a tall man. I like to call him my gentle giant mm -hmm. because he was just that he was a large man but he was like a big teddy bear and just um peaceful and loving very into horticulture um and like to um plant lots of things trees flowers he uh, spliced lilies one of these days you'll see this finished but this is actually one of his lilies that were spliced and will be a part of my sleeve in honor of him um, so one of the things we like to do, do together was crochet. We like to crochet blankets together. In fact, uh, after his murder, um, his dad, my ex-husband, found a partially finished blanket that he had started for his cousin. And so I finished that for him and surprised his cousin with it. And he was just a, he was a great big brother to my daughter. He was a great big brother to his cousin. Um, they called themselves brothers. Um, he was a caretaker. He took care of um, his grandmother, who is not very mobile anymore due to health conditions. And uh, in fact, when I, because we live up in northern Minnesota, when I tried, when he got older and I tried to tell him to come live up with us now, he said he would, but he had to finish taking care of his grandparents. And then he would come and take care of his mom because um, I'm also disabled. Mm -hmm. He was just the most beautiful mm -hmm. thing in the world to me. Mm -hmm. And they took that for no reason at all. And, and we just have to live with that from now on. Yeah, it's just forced. I'll never see my, my boy again because of a split second decision that an untrained police officer made. Amity, can you take us to that fateful day? One thing that I do know is that my son was having a bad day that day. He was on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Autism is not a crime, folks. That's right. And he autism ended up in a fight with his grandparents who he lived with. And he grabbed some weapons to hurt himself. The grandfather called 911 out of concern for my son. Um, my son, DF, you know, calmed down right away. Uh, the grandfather called the police back, said, my, you know, Kobe is fine. Everything's fine. We don't need you to come. The police showed up anyhow, insisted on going in the house. Um, I don't want to get into too many specifics, yeah, but, you know, right. they, um, after interviewing him for about 12 minutes, calmly with no problem, and then my, my son, the last, picture I see before he gets murdered is him with his um, face in his hands just crying because he just wanted them to go and leave him alone. He didn't want to go be put on a psychiatric hold because he didn't ever do anything right. and um, came in and put my son down like an animal. Mm -hmm. Shot him multiple times including in the head in front of his grandmother in his own home on a reverse 911 call and then um, Andy, can you his explain? body to lay there for so long that he couldn't even donate any organs. That's horrific. I'm so sorry. Amity, can you explain to our viewers what a reverse 911 call is? The terminology. It was a call. They put the call in, decided that the call was unnecessary. Like I say, they were concerned that my son was going to hurt himself. That fear went away. As soon as my son came, calmed down, but they came anyhow. And I guess it's just because he had, had weapons, although the weapons were, he would have been threatening to use on himself. They 
they insisted on, you, you can see in what they uploaded to the uh, GA website that, you know, the grandfather says, don't go in. Right. And they literally walked past him into the house. And then 12 minutes later, shot him, murdered him. And they had the nerve to say that they used de-escalation techniques. That's impossible. You can't de-escalate an already de-escalated situation. Right. The only thing they did was come in, escalate a situation that was already under control, right. and then shot my son and trying to act like he deserved it. Yeah. And if there's a situation where there's a family that has a mental health person or a person on the, on the spectrum, the family or the caretakers should be the ultimate deciders in what needs to happen. They're the ones who know how to deal with them. They're the ones who know what the, the person's ups and downs are. They're the ones who know what their triggers are, what will calm them down, and what they need. You got a police officer come in and don't listen to what the family is standing there and telling you. They made a call and reversed it. And then when they came to the house, they still reiterated, everything was fine. Please go away. Right. That's and the fact sad. that they don't respect that knowledge mm -hmm. is absurd. Um, one of the bills that I'm personally trying to push is Kobe's law, which would require body cam videos to families within 48 hours because the whole not being able to see what happened to your loved one and trying to trying to demand justice for them mm -hmm. makes it real hard when you don't even have any information. That's another thing we're trying to pass is the statute of limitations. Yes. There's a bunch of us in the family that have uh, gone over the statute of limitations. So we want to do something retroactive for them, but then also going forward, because as we all know, they hold the information so that we end up running out of time. And then the biggest one, and I think the most challenging one, will be um, ending qualified immunity. Yep. Mm -hmm.